Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Gen webinar, which is entitled Automated Mass Photometry, Easing the Path to Biomolecular Characterization. Our webinar today was made possible through sponsorship from Refine, Measuring Molecules with Light. I'll be your host for today's event. I'm Jeff Bogaliskis, Technical Editor for Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology News, which has been bringing you the latest information about innovations within the life science industry for the past 40 years. Now, on the previous slide, we kind of gave away the surprise when we said measuring molecules with light. But at the end of the day, that's exactly what we're here to talk about and what we're going to be discussing today, mass photometry. This innovative bioanalytical technology was designed to provide insights into the mass distribution of biomolecules as they reside in their native state within just a few minutes and without the need for labeling, surface immobilization, or big sample quantities. The simplicity and single molecule resolution of this technology makes mass photometry the perfect tool for investigators who need rapid assessments of sample purity, binding affinities, or structural integrity across biomolecules, ranging from proteins of diverse size to DNA and even small viruses such as AAVs, something we heard about in a similar webinar earlier this month. Today, however, we're going to discuss how mass photometry can be automated and utilized for important applications such as screening and titration assays. And here to tell us more about those details will be our presenter for today's event, Dr. Gareth Rogers, a product manager at Refine, where he's jointly responsible for the development and deployment of mass photometry systems designed to meet the needs of the biopharmaceutical industry. Gareth has a background in molecular physiology and extensive experience in the photonics industry. And today, Gareth is gonna illustrate for us how automation and the associated improvement in reproducibility can make biomolecular characterization with mass photometry even easier. But before we get the webinar underway, I want to remind the audience that we would love to hear from you in our Q&A session that will begin right after the presentation ends. Gareth's going to be on hand to try to answer as many of your questions as he can. So all you need to do is simply type your question into the Q&A box and hit submit. All right, enough from me. Let's hand things over to Gareth. Hi, everybody. My name is Gareth Rogers and I am a product manager here at Refine and I look after the product portfolio for the biopharma industry. It's a great pleasure to be presenting to you today on the Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology News Platform and thank you for joining us and giving us uh, some of your time today. So here at Refine we're very excited to be launching a new product and in terms of the agenda for this webinar today, I will give you a brief introduction into mass photometry, and then I'll talk to you um, about the new product, and um, you'll be able to see a little bit more um, in relation to what it's all about. So a little bit more about us. Um, our headquarters are based in Oxford in the United Kingdom, and we also have premises in Boston and in Portland, uh, Oregon. So although we are a young company, we have nevertheless uh, supplied um, and sold over 120 instruments all around the world. We're growing very rapidly. We're a company that has um, approximately 80 employees currently, but we're looking to double our headcount within the next 12 months or so. So what is mass photometry? Essentially, it is using light to weigh molecules. And the working principle is very simple. All molecules scatter light and we can measure this scattering. Furthermore, molecules of different mass scatter light to different degrees. So a small lighter molecule will scatter less than a larger heavier molecule. And it has been proven that there is a nice linear relationship between that signal and mass. More specifically, it is the interferometric analysis of the light scattered by molecules in solution that makes it possible to determine the mass. Now, 
three components that contribute to image formation are light reflected from the glass water interface. And this represents a glass cover slip here, as well as the light scattered by molecules in solution, whether it be a protein or a lipid or a nucleic acid. And it is the interference between the scattered light and the reflected light that um, gives rise to these interference patterns that you see here. And the interferometric signal is proportional to the mass of the molecules. So every single event that is detected is counted and a histogram is generated, um, giving us a mass distribution of all of the biomolecules in solution. So this is our second generation instrument called the 2MP. Now it allows us to measure the mass of molecules over a wide range from 30 kilodaltons up to five megadaltons. So we get to look at things like albumin and larger particles such as adeno-associated viruses, for example. Mass photometry is, with the 2MP is fast, accurate, and very sensitive, and we only require a small amount of material. Typically, the measurements will take um, about a minute and then a further minute um, for data processing. It is a label-free method, so we can study um, the unmodified molecules in their native state and in solution. The concentration range uh, that we typically work with is between 100 picomolar and 100 nanomolar. And the instrument uses 488 nanometer um, laser light. And the 2MP is a class one device. So as we can see on the graph here, there is a very good agreement between the measured mass of molecules and the mass that we are expecting to see. So mass photometry can be used to detect and characterize a wide variety of different biomolecules, including proteins and nucleic acids, and can provide information on structure and function. We can also look at viruses too, specifically adeno-associated viruses. Now in this talk, I'll be focusing a little bit more on proteins and nucleic acids, um, but will not be covering um, any information relating to viruses. Now, if that's of interest to you, I would encourage you to check out the great webinar that my colleague um, Svea Cheeseman gave on the 1st of February, which focused on mass photometry and its use for AAV analytics. And that webinar is also available on the Gen Eng news platform. So here we have 2G12, which is a HIV neutralizing antibody. And mass photometry can reveal the oligomeric states of this antibody preparation. So we can see that it forms monomers, in solution, dimers, trimers, and tetramers. And we can see all of these different species with a very small amount of sample. Now, the key thing to note here is that because mass photometry is a single molecule technique, we are able to detect even low abundance species such as the tetramer. And we can see those even in the presence of high abundance species, in this case, the monomer. And one of the great strengths of mass photometry is it gives us immediate information about sample quality. So we can determine whether our antibody preparation is stable. Um, we can look at the purity. We can assess whether there has been any degradation or aggregation. Antigen antibody binding is a prime example of a biomolecular interaction that can be studied um, using mass photometry. So we can determine target binding, but in addition to that, we can also determine binding affinity. For those of you that aren't familiar with Herceptin, Herceptin is a recombinant humanized monoclonal antibody 
that is used for the treatment of early and advanced stage breast cancer. Now, the antibody is multivalent, meaning that it has more than one binding site. In this recording here, we have two separate mass photometry measurements, one for the antigen alone and one for the antibody Herceptin alone. Now, if we then combine these in differing mix ratios, what we can see is, if we just take a look at the blue trace here, the antibody peak, and then we can see a heavier complex here, which consists of the antibody bound to one antigen. Now, if we change the mix ratio so that we now have an excess of antigen, as shown by the orange trace here. So we can still see quite a bit of antigen, but we now can also discriminate a heavier complex um, further still. And this consists of the antibody with all of the antigen binding sites now completely filled. So mass photometry can be used as a quality control, as I mentioned a few minutes ago. So we can look at monoclonal antibody purity and stability, and we can assess oligomerization and aggregation. In addition, we can use it to um, monitor and optimize purification processes as well. So here we're looking at the 700 kilodalton rat proteasome. And as we move through um, gel filtration and chromatography stages, what we can see is the progressive enrichment of the 700 kilodalton uh, rat proteasome. And then we can determine that it's step four that gives us the purest sample in this case. So it's very easy to identify what is the optimal point in the purification process of this particular complex. Another thing that we can look at are protein interactions that are induced by small molecule binding. Now, typically, um, because the detection limit of mass photometry with our 2MP system, as I mentioned earlier, is 30 kilodaltons, uh, we wouldn't be able to detect small molecules directly. However, if those small molecules can induce uh, binding and the formation of larger complexes, then that brings things into a regime where we are able to detect. So if we consider um, PROTAX, for example, and PROTAX stands for proteolysis targeting chimera, these are heterobifunctional degraders that consist of a ligand that binds to a target protein, a linker, and another ligand that recruits an E3 ubiquitin ligase which is a key component of the cell's uh, waste disposal machinery. Now, this PROTAC brings the target protein into close proximity to the ligase, which induces its ubiquitination and then leads to its subsequent degradation. Now, with PROTACs, you can utilize mass photometry to look at ternary complex formation. So a ternary complex consists of the protac, the target protein, and the ligase. And that can be used as a means of um, evaluating or characterizing protein, um, protein, protac activity because that leads to, um, or is often associated with increased ubiquitination and hence the targeted degradation of the protein of interest. So what we can see here are a series of mass photometry measurements that were taken in um, the absence of a PROTAC MZ1 and then with a progressively increasing concentration. So here we have a single peak and within this single peak we have the ligase and we also have a protein that consists of two uh, bromo domains. Now they're very similar in mass so we can't resolve those species within that peak. But as we begin to progressively increase the concentration of PROTAC, what happens is we start to form these ternary complexes, and hence we form these complexes which have a larger mass, leading to a mass shift, which we can then detect using 
the 2MP system. And as we increase the concentration of Protag further still, we begin to see additional complexes forming. And also you may notice that the relative amounts um, change as well. If you increase the concentration of the Protag to a certain level, there will come a point where all of the binding sites are saturated and that will actually inhibit or prevent the formation of these ternary complexes. And this is something that is referred to as the hook effect. So there is a lot of interest um, in Protax and quite a few are going through various um, clinical trial phases. Um, at the moment, there are about 600 E3 um, ligases in the human proteome, each with um, different cell expression profiles. Mass photometry can be used to um, look at other biomolecules too, um, such as nucleic acids. So all six components of the low mass DNA ladder spanning uh, 100 base pairs up to 2000 base pairs uh, can be clearly resolved. And we can use mass photometry to measure the mass or to determine the number of base pairs of DNA um, samples of unknown composition. Here we are using um, mass photometry to determine the mass and homogeneity of a PCR product um, using minimal sample quantities. And the measurement gives a single symmetric peak at 218 kilodaltons, which is equivalent to 331 base pairs. Larger um, DNA species can be analyzed with um, similar precision. So here we're looking at a plasmid called PUC18, and there is a peak here, 2,683 base pairs, which is equivalent to 1,773 kilodaltons. Now, we are continuing to push forward with continued developments of mass photometry. And the question is, is there anything else that we can do? And the answer to that is, is yes. So as a company, we are very interested and very responsive to the marketplace. We like to hear comments and feedback from our end users. And although we've seen the many benefits and advantages of uh, mass photometry, the 2MP system, for example, is very easy to use. There's minimal sample preparation required. There's a wide measurement range and you can get results very quickly. So these are the things that are all rated very highly and considered very favorably for the approach that we have developed. But nevertheless, a few other things have been highlighted as well. It's an inherently manual operation. So samples are uh, loaded sequentially one at a time and there is user to user variability with regard to the petting steps when depositing samples onto the mass photometer. So this can have an impact on things like repeatability and reproducibility. The typical mass photometry workflow is very amenable to automation. There are time consuming pipetting steps. And if you want to scale up a workflow, there are many more monotonous, repetitive manual steps, potentially increasing the likelihood of errors being introduced by the human operator. So this is what we have addressed with the development of our new product. And I'm really excited to introduce to you today, the 2MP Auto. So the end users can still benefit from all of the advantages that mass photometry um, has to offer. But with the 2MP Auto, this makes the automated mass characterization of biomolecules are possible. So samples can be loaded into the instrument, um, which will then be loaded onto the mass photometer. And the end user can then step away from the device whilst the loading and sample measurements take place. Automation greatly improves the accuracy and um, precision of liquid handling from one step to the next. And what this will, automation brings us is results become more accurate, more repeatable, and ultimately making running experiments easier 
and improving the productivity of the research laboratory in which the system is based. But we haven't forgotten our existing customers either with um, this new product. So end users, existing refined customers that have our first generation instrument, the 1MP, and for those users that have the 2MP, they are able to add the auto unit onto their existing system and therefore they have a path to upgrade and can expand the functionality of their existing system. It's intuitive and simple to use and it's straightforward to standardize the workflow, improving consistency. So here we're looking at repeated measurements of the same sample, in this case, uh, IgG. Now, what we can see here is that each of these plots are superimposed, one on top of the other, and we can identify, clearly see that there are, is great reproducibility um, for these mass photometry measurements. Now, if you look here on the right, there is a very low variability in the number of total counts recorded between each measurement. And we also see this is reflected in the measured mass as well. The 2MP auto is also ideally suited for titration assays. Now here we're looking at samples that have been spiked with the same amount of IgG, but progressively increasing amounts of BSA. And the BSA concentration ranges from zero up to 20 nanomolar. Now there is excellent linearity between the number of counts and the BSA concentration, but what you'll also be able to note as well between each of these measurements is that the IgG signal is consistent from one measurement to the next. So the automation clearly shows that the superior accuracy and precision that is offered by the auto device provides significant benefits over performing these operations or steps um, manually. This is a data set from one of our two MP auto users, Dr. Georg Hochberg, who is based at the Max Planck Institute in Marburg, Germany. And this is a ligand titration series. Um, looking at a particular protein. Now, this protein, if we look at the mass photometry measurements on the left here, forms tetramers in solution as well as optimers. Now, the tetrameric form is catalytically active, but the optimers are inactive. And the introduction of a small metabolite promotes a shift in to formation of the optimus. And that's what we're seeing here. We can see that as we increase the ligand concentration, the amount of octameric complexes increases. So there is a concentration dependency here. But it is not just a hardware solution. There is a fully integrated software solution as well, working within our acquisition software called Acquire MP. Experimental protocols can be easily defined. And once those protocols are created, moving from protocol creation to data capture is seamless. So what you can see here is the user interface and you can populate the well plate view here um, with your samples and then define the protocol, um, what volumes are going to be dispensed into the sample wells of the gasket that is loaded onto the mass photometer. Each data set that is um, captured during an acquisition run can be uh, loaded into DiscoverMP software as a batch, and that batch is then analyzed automatically. And the figures can be designed, you can see here is that um, the figures are designed uh, directly in Discover MP, and they can be exported for quick and easy data reporting, which is another great feature of that software. In addition, we've also developed um, a series of consumables for the 2MP Auto platform. Previously, the end user would have to um, follow 
a fairly um, rigorous cleaning protocol in order to be able to um, clean the sample carrier slides. But now this is something that we can offer end users pre-cleaned slides and sample well gaskets, which you can see here. And by having these consumables available, this will further reduce preparation time for the end user. So you might just be able to see that this is what a silicone uh, gasket, which contains a series of wells into which your sample would be deposited. So the key takeaways from this webinar, hopefully you've seen that mass photometry is a unique and versatile bioanalytical technology um, that has been pioneered by Refine. The 2MP Auto is a platform that um, enables the automated um, biomolecular characterization. And now the end user has the ability to step away from the instrument, leaving it to measure multiple samples. So this solution offers repeated measurements that are much more accurate, more precise, and running experiments becomes inherently more easy and it offers productivity benefits to the end user. And just one final slide from me. So it's not just the 2MP also that we're launching this year. Last month, we launched the Samex MP, and this is an instrument that was created specifically for AAV analytics. So you can use it to precisely measure the MT4 capsid ratio for adeno-associated viruses of any serotype. And if that's of interest to you, please check out our website for further details. Thank you very much for your attention. And I look forward to answering your questions. Gareth, great presentation and really fascinating technology. I'm certain that many of our audience members are gonna have quite a few questions for you. So let's get on with the Q&A session. For those audience members who wanna submit a question and wanna ask something of Gareth, don't hesitate, send that on in. All you need to do is type your question into the ask a question box and hit submit. Okay, with that said, and we have a bunch of questions that have come in already for Gareth, let's get to the Q&A session. Bear with us for just a moment as we make the transition into the Q&A. All right, everyone, thanks for joining us for the Q&A session. We have a bunch of questions for Gareth. So Gareth, let's just dive into them. Uh, one of our first questions, an audience member would like to know, what limits your lower range of mass? Um, is it the measurement uh, shot noise limited? Yeah, that's right. So um, yeah, the, the lower limits of mass, which people have seen as 30 kilodaltons, and ultimately this technique is uh, shot noise limited. All right, thanks for that. Uh, next question we have uh, comes from an audience member who asks, uh, is there a requirement for amino acid of protein to measure protein mass? Um, no, so I, I'm, I'm assuming that the person that posted that question uh, was, was wondering if um, an amino acid sequence would be, would be needed. Uh, no, so typically uh, when measuring mass, we are able to infer the mass of a molecule because we also um, have a calibration step. So we'll, we'll use um, a calibrant um, such as uh, thyroglobulin, for example, where we, we know the, uh, the exact mass of the different species within that uh, population. From that, we can um, extract the mass value of the molecules we're looking at. Oh, sorry about that. I uh, muted myself before I was asking the question. So next question we have, Gareth, uh, is an audience member would like to know, what are the potential inhibitory substances? Um, is there relatively high purity material required? Um, yes, uh, ideally, because it is um, a label-free technology, obviously, that we're looking at um, whatever is in solution. So by and large, ideally, the more pure the sample, um, the better. But as um, the audience will have seen um, earlier in the presentation, uh, there was a, a, a data set that we captured looking at uh, the progressive uh, purification and enrichment of um, a proteasome complex. So it is possible to work with slightly more crude 
uh, samples, but um, the, the question uh, posed by the, the end user is, is correct. Ideally, the, the purer the sample, the better. All right, thanks for that. Uh, next question we have is, can the instrument measure lentivirus or VSV virus? So th those um, two viruses are certainly larger um, than what um, our instrument would be able to detect. So I think the uh, lentiviruses are typically 80 to 100 nanometers in diameter, and um, I think VSVs are about 13.3 um, uh, ish megadaltons. So they are they are too big and exceed um, our measurement range. All right, thanks for that. Um, how does the nucleic acid secondary structure affect mass photometry readout? And what about oligodimerization? Um, so in terms of um, secondary structure, that wouldn't um, have um, an effect. Um, it, we can also look at things um, like different uh, protein um, conformation states. So it's also fine if you're uh, looking at a folded protein versus uh, one that's uh, denatured. There are, there, are, there are no issues there. All right, thanks for that. Uh, the next question audience member has is, they say that it appears the method requires a pure solution of molecules in question. Uh, would it also work, for example, in serum or tissue culture? Yeah, so this, um, just in relation to what I mentioned um, in response to a previous question, uh, yeah, so the, the purer um, the, the, the sample, the better. So certainly wet serum and uh, tissue culture um, extracts are concerned that I think that would be uh, that would possibly be uh, too crude and uh, we wouldn't be able to uh, detect um, what they were trying to identify in, in those sample types. Gotcha. Uh, next question. This is an interesting question, actually. Uh, notice we'd like to know, is there a possibility of measuring different amplicons using uh, this machine after PCR instead of running an agarose gel? Yes. Um, I mean, that's, that's a possibility. Um, so the even though we're still doing um, more work and looking into the nucleic acids, uh, one of the slides I, I presented earlier in the talk, um, you can see a PCR product um, that we had um, uh, generated. So we were just looking purely at its uh, mass and also the homogeneity uh, of the sample. Um, so yes, that's something um, that, that end users can potentially uh, use the machine um, to detect instead of uh, running a gel. And the, the advantage of that would be is, uh, the, again, because it's label-free, um, so there's no need to uh, use um, intercalating uh, dyes like ethidium bromide, um, for example. Very interesting. Um, next question we have, uh, the noise member says, slide number 14 shows a small amount of monoclonal antibody dimers. How reproducible is the reproducibility of the relative abundance for this species? The, the reproducibility um, is good, and that is something, with, in terms of putting hard numbers on it, um, that is something that will go into um, one of our revised uh, data sheets um, for the automated mass photometry solution. So uh, yeah, stay, stay tuned, um, and we'll um, update the uh, data sheet in, in due course, and then we'll have some more specifics on the, um, the level of reproducibility that you can attain. All right, uh, next question we have it says that is the 2MP auto compatible if the 1MP is placed on a weighing table to decrease the vibrations? Uh, yes, um, so if the question is, and I may have mis misinterpreted what's being asked there, um, so the, the auto unit, um, it is possible to place a 1MP instrument inside that um, rather than using a 2MP mass photometer. So within the auto unit, there is um, an anti-vibration um, unit. So th that, um, so for the for the one MP, that would be placed on the AV unit, and that combined package would then be um, fitted inside the, uh, the the auto unit enclosure. All right, and um, this is an important question: Is an audit trail available on the software, um, and is it uh, 21 CFR 11 compliant? Unfortunately, uh, not at this stage, but that is something that we are um, looking into uh, because lots of our users um, are interested in that. All right. And can the system be used to determine the mass of small molecules, which I'm going to go with yes on that one, but I'll let you answer that. 
<laughs> sure. So um, it, it just depends on uh, what the, um, the person asking that question means by by small. So if it's if it exceeds 30 kilodaltons, then then yes. If um, the molecules of interest that they're looking at are um, fall below that 30 kilodalton uh, threshold, then no. But um, as I alluded to before, we can still uh, work with um, certain support, small molecules if they are um, capable of inducing oligomerization or the formation of larger, heavier complexes, which will then pull the complex into our weight detection regime. Gotcha. And then the next question is, do you have a 96-well plate consumables? So it's um, for, the, for the automation units, um, we don't supply the 96-well plates our, ourselves, but we, we can um, recommend uh, you know, what, what size they need to uh, conform to. It's just um, an industry standard, so um, yeah, just provided it conforms to the standard, then um, you're pretty much um, free to use whatever 96 well plates um, you want to. Gotcha. Uh, next question comes from Paul, who'd like to know, for which specific steps is the robot used for, and can it be combined with the 1MP? Yes, so to, to answer the second question first, yes, it can be combined with the 1MP. And um, with regards to the steps the um, robot um, is specifically working on, it is all of the liquid um, handling steps from transfer of the sample from the 96 well plate uh, to the, uh, the sample um, well cassettes that contain the, uh, the wells into which samples are deposited. All right, and next question is, how long does it take to complete one acquisition run? So typically, um, running through 14 samples, that would take approximately 60 minutes. Okay, and will consumables for the auto be required, or can users still follow the protocol to develop their own? Um, you know, I think that's, a, that's a good question. Um, so if this is coming from a end user um, that already has some mass photometer, then I see no reason uh, why not. Um, but certainly what we've tried to do um, to improve the workflow and to make things easier for the, for the end user is um, being able to supply consumables now. Um, so the um, sample carrier slides and the um, silicone sample well gaskets that get placed on, on top of those. So hopefully, um, if this question comes from an existing user, um, there are now ways of being able to uh, further reduce the amount of um, preparation time for um, kind of cleaning uh, the carrier slides and also for cleaning the gaskets. We can uh, we can re reduce the, the time taken to do that. All right. Uh, next question comes from Marie, who'd like to know, how many measurements can be performed using the 2MP auto without the intervention of someone? Yeah, so that would be uh, 14 sample measurements um, currently. So that equates to uh, about one hour of um, operator free time. All right. And how many samples can a 2MP... Oh, no, that's pretty much the same question. Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, the next question we have is, um, is any additional software required to set up and optimize the control of the liquid handling robot prior to running an experiment? No, so um, we, we have a fully integrated uh, software solution. So our standard acquisition software called um, Acquire MP, um, that can be used for um, controlling um, everything that um, the end user would want to define in a protocol in terms of uh, volume of sample added and uh, the level of uh, sample mixing as well. So everything is contained within our core acquisition software program, um, Acquire MP. Great. And then a follow-up to that would be, you know, what consumables do I need for the instrument? Yeah, so um, the consumables um, would be um, the peptides um, that would be used for uh, sample transfer, um, also the 96-well plates, and there are uh, some consumables that Refine are now supplying as well, so the sample carrier slides and also the, uh, the sample well um, cassettes also. Um, the only other thing that would be required is kind of like a tip tray or pipette box, and that is just what um, kind of used pipette tips would be uh, deposited um, into during the, uh, the course of an acquisition. All right. Uh, next question comes from Sam, who'd like to know, does the AutoMP feature any temperature control over the samples in the well plate? 
So there, there is no um, temperature control of the samples um, in the well plate, uh, but nevertheless, the, um, the temperature um, within the main chamber of the auto unit is, is stable. But in terms of being able to, um, say, specify um, a slightly um, cooled temperature um, or even to raise the temperature above um, room temperature, that's something that we um, are unable to do um, at the present moment. Jeff, if you're asking a question, I can't hear you. Sorry, just oh, in case. Sorry about that. Yeah. I just I keep hit, hitting my mute too. <laughs> um, so the next question from Michael comes from, um, uh, it says that uh, he may have missed it, but he wanted to know if there was a target launch for the automated 2MP. Yes, it's already launched. So um, we, we officially launched the instrument at the SLAS meeting um, in Boston last week. So official launch date was uh, the Wednesday, the 9th of February, and um, I gave a, a launch presentation at um, SLAS. Excellent. Uh, Michael also asked, uh, is it possible to add on the automated system to an existing 2MP, or would this be an entirely different instrument? No, it, it is possible to uh, to add the auto enclosure on to an existing system. So that's something that um, we'd factored into the, the design of the unit because we didn't want to um, kind of ignore our existing customer base. That was very uh, a very important consideration in how that unit was designed. So um, any of our existing customers that have either a 1MP or a 2MP unit, um, the automated um, enclosure can be uh, added. So uh, it is possible for um, a retrofit. All right. Um, and then Alyssa wants to know, is it possible to set incubation times between sample runs with the new automated MP software? That's a good question. Uh, I think I might have to get back to you on that one, on Alyssa. <laughs> so I've certainly used the system several times, as you, as you might expect. But uh, yeah, that's not something I've done in the protocols that I've followed. But um, I'm assuming that we have your contact details and I'll uh, drop you an email. Uh, separate uh, to uh, the webinar. Alyssa, you win the prize. You stumped Gareth, so but he will definitely be in touch. It's, with you. it's easily done. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, next question we have from Marie uh, would like to know. She'd like to know if the cover slips, which the cover slips, which were described in the presentation, are they coded, and how to handle the coded cover slips with the two MP auto. So the the ones that I was referring to. Um, in the presentation, so that they they are uncoated. Um, so something that we are definitely looking into um, are um, coating cover slips, and um, with with a whole manner of different um, um, coatings. That's of uh, a great interest um, to us in terms of how to handle um, coated cover slips. Um, yeah, there wouldn't need to be any other um, special considerations. I guess it would just depend um, upon. Uh, what you are wanting to uh, to coat your cover slip uh, with, um, that would be the key question, and that may affect how um, the cover slip would need to be handled. All right, and we have time for one last question, also from Marie. Uh, she says, do I understand correctly that the 2MP auto is only transferring the liquid to the well gasket, not performing any dilution? And does this mean the sample uh, needs to be diluted to the appropriate concentration for measurement? If yes, how do you avoid protein adsorption on 96 well plates? It's a very good question, Marie. Um, so yes, I think we're, we're the 90, starting with the 96 well plates first, um, I think it would always be ideal to kind of go with a, with a low binding, low absorption, um, multi-well plate type. Um, th there is, um, Yes, um, there is the option of um, performing um, in-plate dilutions. Um, so that is, um, if you wanted to kind of load a um, concentrated sample, but that um, you wanted to dilute it um, immediately before performing the measurement on the mass photometer, that is um, um, a capability that uh, is is available with uh, with the system. All right, thank you for that, Gareth. And with that, we've come to the end of our webinar. So I'd like to remind everyone that the webinar will be archived on the GEN website, genengnews.com, for up to a year. So if you missed any parts of it, you can watch it again, or feel free to forward the link to any of your friends and colleagues who you think might be interested in. Uh, I'd like to thank Gareth again for his extremely informative presentation, and I'd like to thank you, the audience, for your attention. And very
uh, thoughtful questions. And a very special thanks to Refine for sponsoring this webinar. Hopefully, we'll see you again at another GenWebinar in the future. Goodbye for now. Everyone stay safe and healthy and get your vaccines.